Hi, I'm DJ Ware. On this episode of the Cyber Gizmo, I'm going to be looking at GNU plus Linux. This is going to be another series of probably three videos. It's a, a form of a documentary, and I'm going to be doing past, present, and future. So today is part one, the past. Let's take a look right after this. <music> So yeah, um, I'm gonna try to stay out of the limelight here, and and <laughs> because this isn't about me, this is about what has happened in it with Linux and with GNU and with the Free Foundation, uh, as well as some other organizations that have been very important over time. So yeah, let's we're gonna dive in here and talk about the past a little bit. So I'm gonna start with this quote. This is a uh, from a science fiction writer. He also was a writer for Byte Magazine for many years, did a column called Chaos Manor. And in there is a quote that I want to share with you is, that he said, I think this is really good. Whenever you're talking about something uh, from a standpoint of where you'd like to see it go, I think it's this kind of a, a thinking that's important to keep in mind when you're trying to do things like this. So I want to show you marvels. Dreams in Technicolor with sharp images. I want to tell you something of the wonder and the excitement of science, of the birth of the universe, the black holes, cities of the future, how man and computer can forge between them something greater than the both, of worlds transform, how man may direct the evolution of the stars. I want to show you a world that might be made. So we're going to cover uh, a, a set of people. Uh, Richard Stallman from the Free Software Foundation, uh, Linus Torvalds from the uh, Linux kernel, uh, Eric Raymond from the Open Systems Initiative that he started. I think he's been kicked out of that, sadly. Uh, I hope that they rethink that because, you know, some of his thinking in there was just amazing. Some of the founders, the thinkers and the makers that created, uh, like Patrick Volterding, uh, the Slackware, uh, Ian Murdoch's Debian, of course, he's not in charge of that anymore. Uh, and then Bob Young and Mark Ewing uh, and their development of Red Hat. So uh, then we're going to talk about leaders, dreamers, and architects. And these, I feel, are Daniel Robbins from Gen 2, also fun to. Uh, Mark Shuttleworth from Canonical and Ubuntu. And also the four from SUSE. Uh, Roland Dioff, uh, Thomas Fair, Hubert Mantel, and uh, Bukhard uh, Steinbolt, or Steinbilt, Steinbilt. Uh, so yeah, we're, we're going to talk about all of these things. So I'm going to let uh, uh, Richard Stallman talk about the Free, Sound, uh, free uh, uh, Software Foundation in his own words, and what he wanted to accomplish with that. Free software means software that respects the user's freedom. Now, to be more specific, there are four essential freedoms. Freedom zero is the freedom to run the program any way you like. Freedom one is the freedom to study the source code and then change it to do what you like. Freedom two is the freedom to distribute copies to other people. And freedom three is the freedom to publish a modified version so others can get the benefit of your improvements. I like to call freedoms one, two, and three the freedom to help yourself, the freedom to help your neighbor, and the freedom to help build your community. Freedom one, the freedom to help yourself, is the freedom to study and change the program. The freedom to help your neighbor is the freedom to distribute copies. And the freedom to help build your community is the freedom to contribute your improvements. So it's the same four freedoms that cooks are accustomed to for recipes. So imagine if someday the government starts saying that if you copy or change or share a recipe then you're a pirate and they'll put you in prison for years imagine how angry people will be well that's the same anger that started the free software movement I said how dare you try to stop me from changing software. How dare you tell me that I can't be a decent person by sharing software? I said I refuse to live that way. I said I won't stand for that non-free software. So I was determined to get it out of my life, to reject it. And 
that required a lot of work, and that work is the free software movement. I'm going to do the same thing for Linus Torvalds, let him explain in his own words what he had hoped to accomplish. So this is astonishing, because working this way, you're able to run this, this vast technology empire. It is an empire. So that's, that's an amazing testament to the power of open source. Tell us how you got to understand open source and how it led to the development of Linux. I mean, this was how I started Linux, too. I did not start Linux as a collaborative project. I started it as one in a series of many projects I had done at the time for myself, uh, partly because I needed the end result, but even more because I just enjoy programming. So it was, it was about the, the end of the journey, which 25 years later we still have not reached, but it was really about the fact that I was looking for a project of my own. And there was no open source really on my radar at all. And uh, what happened is the project grows and becomes something you want to show off to people, right? Really, and this, is, this is more of a, wow, look at what I did. And trust me, it was not that great back then. I made it publicly available, and it wasn't even open source at that point. At that point, it was source that was open but there was no intention behind using the kind of open source methodology that we think of today to improve it. It was more like, look, I've been working on this for half a year. Uh, I'd love to have comments, right? And other people approached me. I had a, uh, at the University of Helsinki, I had a, a friend who was one of the open source. It, it was called mainly free software back then. And, and he actually introduced me to the notion that, hey, uh, let's, that you, can, you can use these open source licenses that had been around. And, uh, and I thought about it for a while. I was actually worried about the whole commercial interests coming in. I mean, that's, that's one of the worries I think most people who start out have is that they worry about somebody taking advantage of their work, right? And uh, I decided, what the hell? Patrick Volterating, I don't have any video from him. However, he was one of the first. I mean, there was, there was a few um, distributions that were created before this. There was SLS, and there was another one from another one from Manchester, England. It was a university in Man uh, Manchester. Uh, I can't find anything out, out about that other than the fact that it was the first to use X11. And then, of course, there was a cut, about three or four distributions that were text only that were very difficult to install. Uh, in fact, you had to bit nibble the MBR track on your hard drive in order to get the uh, uh, boot track to be installed. So not fun, not fun. Uh, Debian uh, from uh, Ian Murdoch and the development of the social contract uh, and also the Debian free software guidelines, which, by the way, fed into the open source initiative. So a lot of the things that were done by these people have forwarded on into uh, other initiatives and become kind of a part of the community. Uh, Eric Raymond's uh, open source initiative, he, he I don't know if he coined the term open source, but it, it was probably him. Uh, we didn't call it open source in the beginning. We called it free software. And uh, open source came later. I'll let him talk about that in his own words. Also, he brought about the open source initiative, and you'll find the source definition uh, in here, the open source definition in those documents on the website. And you can go back to Debian and you can see that they're almost exactly the same. If you walk into an executive's office and you say, free software, okay, if you're lucky, the response you'll get is something like, hmm, hmm, uh, free software must be cheap, shoddy, worthless. Uh, and if you're not lucky, it has uh, associations with uh, with the Free Software Foundation's wholesale attack on intellectual property rights, which regardless of what you think about the ethics of that, it's lousy marketing. It's not something that, that uh, businesses want to hear. Uh, we decided early on that what we needed a, a, a definition. We needed a kind of meta license 
to define the term open source. And what we came up with is a document called the Open Source Definition. It's derived from the Debian Free Software Guidelines that were originally written by Bruce Parent. So Richard Stallman never really supported the idea of open source. He felt that it really missed the point of free software. And that if you had open source, but you could hit that if you divided the thing and you set up we had free and you had open source, then you had the potential that open source could lead to software that was not free. And that is the point of his article here. So whether you agree or disagree with him, I, I mean, I, I'm not here to judge. But I, I will talk about this. This was... This was kind of a watershed moment. This is back in the early history, you can see in 1976, of the Homebrew Computing Club in San Francisco where uh, Bill Gates had been working on the Altair, uh, which was one of the early microprocessors. But yeah, that was before my time in, in the computer industry. But uh, yeah, I was about this time I was messing around with supercomputers. So these little micros were not... <laughs> I remember, but in here he's talking about uh, people stealing software, and in, in this case, basic. So he's talking about the value of the time that they have spent um, porting basic onto the Altair was about 40k, and no one, and they're all trading it, giving it to each other, and letting each other have it, and they're not getting any revenue from it. So he's he's writing a letter to the open uh, to the uh, homebrew community club saying, you got to kick these guys out that aren't paying for this. This isn't fair. It's not right. And then at the end, he says, I would appreciate letters from anyone who wants to pay up or has a suggestion or comment. Just write to me at my address here. Um, and, he, you know, he's he, nothing would please me more than being able to hire 10 programmers in a deluge the hobby market with good software. So, yeah, I mean, I think this was, um, you know, a lot of people look at this letter and treat it like it's the declaration of war against open source. But I don't, I mean, I don't think that's really what he meant by this. I think what he meant by it was, hey, um, this is not free and open source. This is commercial software that we developed and we want our license fees for it and we expect to be paid. So, I mean, if you're going down that road and you're using free and open source. Now, one could argue, and I remember this argument very well, that BASIC was developed at a university, Dartmouth in particular, uh, and <clears throat> because it was at, developed at a university, the code for that went into the public domain because... Uh, at this time, that was the general feeling that if you develop source code at a university with taxpayers' money, that software became public domain. So, yeah, there's 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 a lot of thoughts on this. I uh, I'm not going to revisit it again and again. <laughs> We've already been through all that channel of history. So one of the things that always makes a operating system successful is well, a lot of people in the industry always refer to as the killer app. So what the heck is a killer app? A killer app is a piece of software that is so compelling. It's something that you have to have, you want to have, and you're willing to go out and buy hardware and operating systems and software just to get it up and running so that you can use it. Killer apps have always been the cornerstone of success for a new computer architecture. A lot of people say, well, no, you, it's the it's the fact that you have all this uh, dearth of software out here. And no, that's, no. <laughs> no. Um, you know, when the IBM PC came on the market, it had no, absolutely no software at all. And in fact, one of the, and in fact, they ported VisiCalc over to the IBM PC and that became the killer app for them as well for some time until a better version of it was invented called Lotus 123. And of course that became the cornerstone, in, as you can see here in 1985 and going forward. So yeah, I mean, um, it's always something, it is always the killer app. It hasn't got anything to do with what the computer runs, how much software it has on it. Um, I mean, those may be secondary factors, but what drives people to migrate over to your equipment is the killer app.
So what was the killer app for the Apple Macintosh? Well, at first, they, uh, Steve Jobs thought, oh, it'll be the user interface. This is, we've got, you know, some applications we're giving uh, away with it, like draw and, or excuse me, paint and write and some other things like that. But that nah, wasn't enough. And they did not sell as many as they thought they were would sell in it. But what was the, what, what really made the Macintosh successful? What, what saved it? Well, what saved it was the desktop publishing. That was the killer app for the Macintosh at the at the beginning when it became actually demanded. When graphics de and also uh, graphics designers jumped in because when you're doing publishing, uh, you have commercial design for uh, graphics and you also have uh, font designers and people that are doing layouts and all that kind of stuff. So. Yeah, that, it was the it was desktop publishing that really propelled the Macintosh forward. What about Windows? Well, now this is my opinion. I mean, there's probably all there's probably all, you know you could you could add games were probably one of the killer apps for uh, Microsoft Windows. They still are, but I would say from the business world, it was Microsoft Office Suite and Microsoft Exchange Server that really cemented uh, Windows in the corporate world over any of the others. So, I mean, they already had the PCs, They, I mean, the majority of them, and uh, majority of the corporations were already using MS-DOS-based PCs. So, yeah, I would say that was the killer app that actually increased the adoption of Windows, because Windows was, it was unstable, it was kind of clunky, and a lot of, I mean, people used it kind of, but, you know, you had the blue screen of death versions of it, so it wasn't a particularly fun thing to do any kind of work in, because by the time <laughs> you wanted to save your document, the machine crashed. Um, for the Linux server, the killer app was the Apache, and it was called the Web Server Engine at the time, but uh, today it's called the HTTP Server Project. That was really the killer app for Linux. That that propelled Linux into the server marketplace and cemented it there. It also cemented Sun there too. So both of them got a leg up uh, because of, of Apache. And Microsoft, uh, they came later uh, to the uh, internet space, but as you probably all remember, they were they were pretty late to the game. They were pretty late to the game. So the killer app for, I was looking around for the desktop, the Linux desktop, and um, hmm, uh, I can't think of, I can't think of any, so I went out and looked at, you know, some, what users had been talking about, what they think the killer app is, and <laughs> some of the answers are here on this wordy. Uh, it's Shell, really. Yum, uh, APT was listed, VI was listed, languages like Rust was listed, User interfaces like KDE. I mean, I mean, I don't know about you, but I wouldn't call any. Those are all supporting pieces of software. I mean, you can run. I mean, you can get similar types of environments on other other places that do that sort of thing. I mean, you, you can run MySQL on Windows. You can run MySQL on Mac. So why why would that be a killer app for Linux? So the truth is, there isn't one. That's what I think. So. Uh, but here's your chance. If uh, I mean, put in the comments below what you think that the Linux killer app is for the desktop. I mean, I'd be interested to hear. Um, yeah, you can see that some of them are desktop managers and package managers and uh, programming language. One of them is the G parted. Uh, Okie dokie. I mean, that's that's just. I mean, all right. I'm not going to argue with people's choices on the killer app, but. None of those things would compel me to go to Linux. None of those would. So is that the reason why Linux as a desktop is not moving anywhere? Could be. So open source was kind of stuck. I mean, it, up till 1998, it was kind of stuck. The venture capitalists were not willing to invest in any companies that were doing open source because... Uh, free? How do you make money? I mean, where's your profitability coming from? How do I make money if I'm going to invest a ton of cash in you to help you get your business started? Where how do I get my money back? So yeah, I mean, um, the one of the lead developers for Netscape went to uh, Jim Barksdale, who was CEO of Netscape at the time. 
he was comp- he was convinced that open source was the way to go. And he went to talk to Jim Barksdale and, and talk to him about it. And I'm sure Barksdale had a ton of questions. He's a very smart guy. And uh, um, Barksdale said, all right, let's do it. And he backed it. And, you know, if you got a backing from a CEO, things are going to happen. So Netscape was really the first to take a commercial product, their Netscape uh, Navigator, which they charged for, and put it in the open source. But they didn't just take Netscape and, and turn it into an open source product. They created Mozilla.org uh, in order to use that as the facility. And then later on, they Netscape... Um, I think it was a few years, maybe four or five years later, where they came out and said, okay, we're not going to develop on uh, Navigator anymore. You need to go over and start using the Mozilla browser. So uh, in 1998, this was when, this is the release of 2.110. It it isn't 110, it's 2.110 of Linux. And that that had 1.5 million lines of code and about 7.5 million users. So we started out, uh, with 0.01, which had about 10,000 lines of code, and of course one user, which was Linus, and, uh, and then, yeah, and by and by 1998 we had you know uh, 7.5 million users using it, pretty fantastic. Also in that year, um, Microsoft came under the under fire from the U.S. Department of Justice for alleged antitrust violations of the Sherman Trust Act. And so they began anti- antitrust proceedings against Microsoft, which I think lasted a total of two years. Uh, but during the, <clears throat> during the course of that, some documents surfaced that were internal documents. They're known as the Microsoft Halloween documents. And in there, and I think Eric Raymond received these and he put them up on his website for people to read. But in there was internal documents written by Microsoft detailing their plans to deal and both the outline of the threat and how they were planning to deal with the Linux threat. It was around this time that Microsoft began, uh, there there was these comments that would come out of the blue. Microsoft, uh, one, of the, one of the vice presidents said, uh, you know, Linux is cancer. In there, they actually had information about the threat they detailed um, kind of, uh, they did a competitive analysis of Linux versus Windows at the time. And Microsoft, of course, made changes to their development strategy based on the, what they had, you know, what they had done. But also in the, in the next year, I think it was February the 15th that was set aside in 1999 as uh, an open source day where users <laughs> Well, uh, went back and got tried to get a refund from Microsoft Windows on software they weren't using. So, it, as you know, most new machines come with Microsoft Windows, and for a long time that was referred to as the Microsoft tax. It was the add-on cost to buying a PC. So they weren't using it, and they wanted to have it taken off and return the license back to Microsoft for a refund. Microsoft told them that, hey, this isn't our problem. You need to go talk to your OEM vendor. OEM vendors, of course, said, hey, this isn't our problem. That's a condition of the, of the license with Microsoft. You need to go back to Microsoft. And so in, in an infinite loop, they went. But one of the companies that, that saw this said, and that was IBM, they said, oh, okay, well, we'll just start op- offering PCs that don't have a Microsoft license added onto it. So if you you don't want the Windows license, you can click the box and say you don't want it. So this is uh, one of the laptops I used around this time frame. This is a ThinkPad 770, which was a brick. It was seven pounds. Most of the IBMers at this time were moving from OS2 over to Windows. Uh, IBM was internally was back and away from support on OS2, although it took a few more years for it to commercially drop out of the marketplace. But internally, uh, IBM was encouraging people to move over to Windows. Well, I, I, <laughs> I was working with the lab quite a bit, so 
they were all running redhead on theirs and I was like, oh, you, how do you get the mail? And they had servers set up that did that, that did the translation. So great, I was all good to go. I had, uh, I had all the things I needed to get into the network and everything worked and yeah, I just didn't look back. This is about the, the time when I started using uh, Linux full time. So Red Hat was one, the very first company that was based on open source to go public on August the 11th in 1999, and um, it was you know it was very it was successful. They their stock prices of course went up and down depending upon what was going on, but overall they did pretty well. And IBM um, bought them in October the 28th of 2018. And Red Hat still operates today, but they operate as an independent subsidiary of IBM. So um, VA Linux was the second company to go public on October the 7th, 1999. They set a record for the for any IPO uh, price. They set a record of $250 a share, which at that time was totally unheard of. And of course, uh, uh, it was only a few years later that VA Linux exited the computer business, citing uh, mounting losses of their uh, that and and the fact that their stock share price was in the bucket of two dollars and sixty one cents a year a share. So they just they delisted and they left the marketplace. Uh, in 1999, Linux 2.2 was released. Now you'll notice that we went from 1.5 million lines of code uh, with Linux uh, 2.1. 10 to this version and I think probably that was because they probably started to as they always do they do clean out drivers from time to time most of the code that's inside the Linux kernel talked about this before are device drivers but the lines of people in just one year had, swole, had swelled from 7.5 to 12 million users so yeah pretty amazing um, so some final thoughts um, of where we are so in 1991, uh, Linux uh, 0 0.01 was released with 10,000 lines of code and one user Linux. And by 2001, Linux had 66% of the market share of web servers. They command over 98% of the web server market share today. So, and almost 100% of the cloud market. Um, so you'll probably, uh, as we get into the present, I'll talk more about you know where things are position-wise. But yeah, Linux on the server market, definitely successful, definitely successful. Netscape moved their browser to open source. During this period, two Linux, com two Linux companies had gone IPO, uh, and open source was finally being recognized by venture capitalists, and that brought additional money and additional help for people wanting to support developers during the creation of open source projects. And without that, people would be doing this on their own time, right? And with no compensation whatsoever. Kind of hard to hold people to a project when they really have nothing to gain for it except for experience. So, yeah. And finally, I'd like, to, I'd like to close this out today with a quote by uh, Linus Torvalds. There were open source projects and free software before Linux was there. Linux, in many ways, is one of the more visible and one of the bigger technical projects in the area, or this area. And it changed how people looked at it because Linux took both a, a practical and an ideological approach. So if you're looking to, if you're, if you're looking to come uh, to a new operating system, it's not new. It's thirty years, thirty years plus. But if you're looking to get away from uh, today, we most of our operating systems are very bloated. Uh, they have <laughs> adware in it. Uh, some of they collect data on your activities. A lot of them don't do functions besides just manage the application base they're trying to do everything for you from you know managing how how your messaging works to how you post documents and where you store them and it's just those are things well past what an operating system should do the way i have always looked at operating systems and i don't look at linux any different is 
It should disappear. It shouldn't be up in my in my line of sight at all. It shouldn't care about what I'm running. The only thing that I'm really concentrating on whenever I'm doing something is the application I'm currently running. That's the most important thing to me. If it crashes in the middle of what I'm trying to do and I lose work, well, I can't have that. Uh, if, uh, if it's taking cycles up to show me advertising and interrupting me when I'm trying to do work, I don't like that. And if it's, if it's gathering data on me, anyway, that's all I had to say for today. Uh, see you next time. We'll talk about Linux present. Bye for now.